Hello everyone. Thanks for joining me in today's tips and tricks webinar, click and rest tips for tapping into all your data. This webinar will primarily introduce you to our click rest connector and show you how you can integrate data into your business applications from web-based data sources that support a restful interface. Please note that the click rest connector is available in ClickSense desktop, ClickSense enterprise, ClickView, and has recently been added to ClickSense Cloud Business. I will cover this later in the demonstration. So on today's agenda, I'll be briefly describing what REST is and why it's important. I'll discuss the Click REST connector itself, its terminology and mechanics, and then we'll spend the rest of the webinar with live examples and demonstration of the REST connector in action. We'll finish up with a few tips on when to use it and some of its limitations. And I'll also make mention of other connectors which allow direct connectivity to additional web-based sources, similar to what REST offers, but made available as an add-on in a specific package called the Click Web Connectors. But first, I'd like to make mention of where you can learn more by briefly telling you about the Click Continuous Classroom. The Click Continuous Classroom is a subscription-based self-service online learning platform that's been designed to provide the Click knowledge that's right for you right now. You basically choose what you want to learn, when and how you want to learn it. It has been designed for various roles and users where you can select your own customized pathways and learn the way you want. Content includes videos, hands-on exercises, assessments and quizzes, downloadable materials, as well as live chats with instructors and peers, and you can also join the discussion in the online forums. You can get started with Click Continuous Classroom by visiting qcc.click.com. Okay, so let's jump into what REST is and how it can help you tap into all your data. So in its simplest form, REST which stands for Representational State Transfer, can be considered an API. So, what is an API? An API is simply a set of rules describing how one application can interact with another, including the mechanisms that allow such interaction to happen. So, a good analogy for this that I've used before that anyone should be able to relate to is think about when going to a restaurant and having a meal. Your interaction or intent is wanting to have a meal at the chosen location. Now, the mechanisms involved are getting to the restaurant and telling the wait staff what you want to eat. Now, while you're there, you have a few rules to follow, such as only ordering what is on the menu and paying the bill at the end of your meal. In response, the wait staff brings you what you ordered, etc. Now, compare that to the underlying REST technology. Your interaction or intent is to access data from or even send data to a specific system. The mechanisms involved are on how you achieve this through standard web HTTP or HTTPS protocols. And there are rules to be applied, such as what are the URLs, the resources, endpoints, methods, and parameters. And those advise you on what it is you can send or receive back. And then there is the response, which is usually a data schema of the formatted values and members, but you can also have a message that returns just acknowledging the success of the operation. Here is a simple diagram of that operation. Okay, so let's break this down and I'll give you a couple examples. So here we have a RESTful service request in the form of a URL. And you can see how I have broken it down here. And this is actually accessing the Spotify API, which is an online streaming service for music. And this does not require any authentication. This is basically a open API where if I put this URL in a browser, I will actually get a response back. And this is representing a method of get. 
And if we break it down, you can see the mechanism is going through HTTPS protocol, the server URL, that's how I'm accessing the service. Then it has the resources and path. It's also known as an endpoint. And then if there's any other request parameters, you would apply here. In this case, this is an example that returns back a public track. So watch what happens if I actually click this link. It opens up in a browser and it returns a JSON schema, which is JavaScript object notation. It's basically a nested form of values and members like a tree structure. And if we look at it, there's valuable information in here that other parsers and applications and programs can actually extract from and include that within a data model that you might use in your business. Just to give you a couple example here, you can see available markets. Um, you can see the name of the artist here, Pitbull. Um, it actually gives you a reference to the particular artist album. It also shows you images and the height of the image, I guess, for the album cover. And it continues with a couple other tracks here. And this is just a sample example of how you receive a response back from that open API. Now, if I go back to the presentation slide and we look at another one, this is an example of a post, and this is using the API for Twitter. Now, in order to get this to work, there is actually an authentication method that has to happen. Now, I've already done that authentication method. A lot of these applications, whether it's Google Analytics, Twitter, Facebook, Spotify, LinkedIn, etc., usually have a console that you can explore the different resources and methods, and then they also have different authentication options that you can apply. So. Here we have, again, our endpoint. In this case, this actually specifies the data format to return. And here I'm actually posting a status message in my Twitter feed that says a test message. So if I go to my browser and we go to the API console for Twitter, I've already authenticated. It provided me with what's called an access token. And you can see they allow you to test a variety of different uh, services, authentication methods, as well as different queries. Now this one here is just a status query. So here it says a test message. When I click send, and here's my response, 200, if I actually go to my Twitter feed and refresh, you can see right here above, actually below my pinned tweet seven seconds ago, a test message was posted. Okay, and that's an example of how using the RESTful service can be used to get data from a service or even post data to a service. So why REST, you may ask? Frankly, it's a primary architecture of the web. 70% of public applications and services use and provide RESTful services for daily operations. It deals with not only reading data, but also updating, deleting, posting, and many other operations. It is extremely flexible and easy to build on top of. For those that write code to interact with it, I've been told it is very simple and lightweight, requiring much less code than other APIs. The results it provides are easy to read, and it uses proven open standards, such as JSON, CSV, XML, HTTP, etc. And it is secure, and can support many authentication mechanisms. Okay, so now we get to the part where Click comes in. To make a long story short, Click has a connector for the ClickSense and ClickView platforms where you configure according to the RESTful service API that you want to access. Based on the configuration and query parameters defined, a request is made from the connector to the service and a response schema is generated and returned in the form of JSON, XML, or CSV, if the result formatting options are available. Usually JSON is the default schema that is returned. Click then parses the response to be used as columns and rows as part of a data table. This can be used by itself or associated with other data in your data model. Now, before I dive into the configuration screen, here are some various supported options for the Click REST connector. It only supports GET and POST methods, so you cannot issue DELETE, UPDATE, CREATE operations if the REST service supports it. You're limited to just GET and POST. The resulting response formats that are supported are JSON, CSV, 
and XML. That means if those responses are returned, we'll automatically recognize those. It supports window authentication, basic authentication, and X509 certificates. At the moment, it does not support direct OAuth authentication, but this can still be achieved by configuring your REST application to provide an application token and provide that token in a parameter, either in the query or header, during the configuration. We have videos and help documents that go into this in more detail. The connector supports automatic key generation, so you can link up nested schemas. You will see this in more detail in one of my demos. And there are also a number of pagination mechanisms which are supported. And these are commonly used when the REST service limits the number of values that are returned in a single request. So you need to let the connector know that it needs to issue a subsequent request to get more data based off of the RESTful services supported pagination type. And you'll see this in action as well. Okay, so let's see some of this in action. And to start, I will continue with Spotify. I'll give you a brief example using Facebook. And then we will use something entertaining that I found called the Star Wars API. I think that example that I show you will be a great primer to see how easy it is to get started with REST and the Click REST connector. Okay, so I'll continue with the Spotify API example, which uses offset paging. Now here's an example of the ClickSense REST connector screens that I'll configure. In this example here, when I tested this, I used the Spotify tracks, which returns all the list of my tracks from my albums. But in this example, I'm actually going to use the albums endpoint, which returns all the albums. And you can get an example of how these configuration parameters are set. So I actually have installed the Spotify client and I added a number of different albums. I believe I have 34 albums here. And then there's also the artist's name associated with these albums. If I go back to my browser and I go to the Spotify web API console, what I'm going to do is grab an authentication token. Okay, so Spotify uses OAuth, and in order to use the ClickSense REST connector with OAuth, you must get an application token. So in this case here, I'm just going to quickly get the token. And you can see I'm looking at the album's endpoint. There's a variety of different endpoints here to choose. Keep in mind, every service, or mostly every service that has APIs or RESTful API should have some sort of user's guide that explains a lot of the information, the parameters, the endpoints, etc. So please refer to your application's user guide or API console for more information. So once again, we're ready to retrieve all the albums. I'm going to click try it and you can see the response that is returned below. This is the response that we're going to get into ClickSense and then we're going to parse. One other thing to point out as as you play around with these consoles, you'll notice that there's valuable information that is returned in these results, such as here you can see limit 20, next, offset, and total. These values are going to be used actually in the configuration parameters of the ClickSense uh, REST connector. Okay, so I'm going to grab this endpoint and copy it. And then we're going to go into the ClickSense Cloud Hub where I've already created an app. Now keep in mind, the ClickSense REST connector is available with ClickSense Enterprise, ClickSense Desktop, as well as ClickSense Cloud Business, which I'm in now here. And I'm going to click Add Data, connect my data, and then click REST. And then I'm going to paste that URL right in that location, leave these methods default. For the key generation strategy, I'm just going to leave those as sequence ID for now. Pagination, I'm going to set to none for now so you can see the difference. And then one more thing I need to do is set that authorization parameter. So in the query header, if we go back to the Web API console and you see the curl command, you can see that there is this authorization parameter and then there's the bera and the token. That information must be placed in this configuration query header parameter. Okay, this will vary depending on which RESTful API you use. Okay, and then the name, I'll just call this Spotify REST. And that gives the connection a name, and I click the right arrow. If there's an error, you'll get a message that pops up. Sometimes messages will pop up if the query parameters are not correct or if a value is left missing. 
Okay, you can see the response type, it's JSON set to auto detect, and then we can start traversing these nodes that came back. Okay, and there's the information for the album, the artist. Now, these are actually like sub schemas or nested schemas in the response. Okay, so you're not going to need all of them. And the way the key generation strategy works, it kind of links these values together so you can create multiple tables. I'll give you an example. So I'm not interested in any of this other information other than what's in album and then artist. So I'm going to uncheck everything else. And then under album, you can see we have some uh, header columns. Okay. And then you can see the key generation here. If I hover over here, key items and key album, these columns link these particular values to the other set of values that are in these sub schemas. Okay. I'll give you another example of that later. But what I am going to want to do is I want to rename this because you can see it has a name as name underscore U2. I want to just call this album name. And then for artist, you can see there's also name here. I'm going to call this artist underscore name. And that's all I'm going to do right now. Okay. And keep in mind, those keys are linked. So we're going to get two tables that are automatically linked to each other. And I'm going to click load data and finish. Okay, and in this case here, I'm going to click Open Data Manager just so you can see how it links those tables together. Now, there was another table called External URLs, which I did not uncheck, so it just happened to link those values together. Okay, so let's go back into that app, and let's go edit the sheet, and I'll create a very simple visualization. Let's grab our KPI. And I mentioned that we have 34 albums, so let's grab the album name and let's just do a count of album names. And you can see that 20 returned. Okay. See, I sounded surprised because I thought I got it wrong, but then I just remembered I didn't have my pagination setting. See, so I was about to stop and start over. But in this case here, we have 20 albums that are displayed. So we go to table, add a dimension, album name, go to my field list and artist name. Okay, there's the artist and there's the albums. Now, pagination is basically going to allow us to retrieve more records. Okay, and we need to use the pagination settings for that. So what we're going to do now is go back to our app and we're going to go into the data load editor. And the reason we're going into the data load editor is because we need to edit that particular connection that's been auto-generated. So here's the section of the script that is auto-generated by the wizard. I unlock this. Now, I don't have to mess around with the script, but I can now edit the connector. Now, going to the connector, I'm going to scroll down to the pagination type, and that's offset. Okay. Now, you might say, well, how did I know that? And it's listed in the API user guide, but also if we look at the response at the end of the schema, you can see that it has a value here for offset limit. Okay, so you need to know what the pagination type is for the RESTful service, and usually the documentation will tell you that. Okay, so the start parameter here is going to be offset, and the initial value is going to be zero. The count parameter is basically the limit, so we're going to set a limit of 10, and the count here is 10, so it's going to pull those 10 records back at a time. And then the total records path is actually how you traverse that node structure. The first part of it being root and then a forward slash and the next one being total. And you might say, well, where are you getting that total value from? And once again, if we go back to that response, you can see there's the total. That's part, the next value right after this complete structure called root. Okay, which is, you know, this part of the response from here. Okay. So now I'm going to click save and then load data. And I'm going to quickly switch back over to the app and you're going to see this is going to refresh to 34. And then you're going to see we have more values listed in the table. Okay. So that's just a quick example using a RESTful service, in this case, Spotify, which requires OAuth or a token, as well as utilizing the pagination setting for offset. 
Okay, so the next example I want to give you is using Facebook and its feed endpoint. And this would be great for an organization to learn about sentiment, let's say for a product or service. I know myself, if I've been particularly pleased or dissatisfied with a particular product, I might post about it on Facebook. And if it's set in a public setting, um, I've had companies retrieve that information and have their social media teams contact me to either apologize or to offer me compensation or a replacement for a particular product. Um, and they wouldn't have known about that if they weren't running some sort of sentiment analysis uh, within the social media sphere. So this is an example of how you can connect the ClickSense REST connector to a Facebook feed. Now keep in mind, there are applications that need to be set up and there's tokens that need to be grabbed, et cetera. So there's some prior steps to setting all this stuff up. In the next example, what I show you, the Star Wars API, you just paste the URL in and it works. You don't have to set up tokens. You don't have to set up applications. You don't have to authenticate against anything. So I'll save that for last. But again, this is another real world use case where you could actually integrate Facebook results into your business. Uh, do you understand there is what's called the Graph API. You might want to learn about the endpoint and the API using the documentation provided by Facebook. Um, and then also using the Graph API Explorer to retrieve the various fields and see the responses that come back. And you'll notice that the paging mechanism this time is not offset like it was with Spotify. In this case, it uses something called paging and it has a URL that retrieves the next set of records. So we would actually use the pagination capability in the connector called next URL. And you'll see that when I configure it. So let's go to our browser. I'm in ClickSense Cloud Business. I have an app created already. And we're going to add the data. Connect my data. And I'm going to click the rest connector. And then we're going to add the URL or the endpoint. If I go to the Graph API Explorer, which is provided for Facebook for developers, you can see here is my URL, graph.facebook.com. We have a version number. The endpoint is me, and it has some parameters that go along with it. So I'll get a fresh token. That way we'll make sure nothing expires and we have all the appropriate access. And I'll click Submit, and you can see the response return. Okay, and you can see here some feed posts, create times and IDs, about the information that I'm posting to my Facebook feed, which I have a sample one here. In this case here, what we'll do is um, we'll configure the connector and we'll post a real-time feed and you can see it pop up in my list. So I'm gonna paste that URL right in here. And you'll notice where it says question mark fields equal feed about and likes. These are the fields that are returning. These are parameters. I could actually take this fields parameter and put it in the query parameters. And then the value feed about likes I could paste it right there and use that for query parameters. So you don't necessarily have to put it in line in the URL. Okay, uh, pagination, next URL, and the path in this case is root paging next. And again, in case you're curious where I got that from, in the API Explorer, you can see there's the paging and then next. So kind of think of it this way, you have the top level root so R-O-O-T slash paging, P-A-G-I-N-G slash next. That's kind of how I think of it when I do this. Okay, so we have our connector. And then there's one more thing we need. We need our query header. So I know from the documentation that it needs a parameter for authorization. And then the value is Bera space and then the... Um, token. So I'm just going to copy that token and then paste it right here and then give my connection a name and we'll call it Facebook REST. Okay, it was successful. Moved on to the next screen. Here's our tree structure and there's my data. So here we have test three presenting tips and tricks webinar. Well, I have a test right here for test four. I'll take that. I'll go to my sample Facebook page. I'll post it in my feed. And we'll go back. 
And in this case here, we're just going to choose that data node, load data and finish. Edit the sheet. Grab my table, add a dimension, and there's my messages. And there's test four, presenting tips and tricks webinar using the REST connector. Okay, so wanted to show you, again, a simple example, this time using Facebook, and then the pagination setting that you would use there, as well as the need to authorize with the token. Okay, and finally, with this particular demonstration, I want to show you the Star Wars API. And this would be one pretty much anyone can use immediately, right off the bat, utilizing the ClickSense REST connector. So the configuration screen is fairly simple. There are a number of endpoints. I'll show you the API documentation in a moment. But you don't have to worry about setting up any authorization parameters or tokens or um, anything of that matter. It's just an open API. It works immediately. So you paste in your endpoint, and then the next URL, in this case, is root slash next. And if there's additional parameters, you can put them in the query parameters. But it's pretty straightforward. So if I go to my browser, I have an app already created in ClickSense Cloud, but I'm also at the Star Wars API webpage, and it's swapi.co. Fairly simple. And if you go to the documentation, it'll show you a variety of different, they call them resources, but again, as I mentioned, I've seen the terms used synonymously. Uh, people, vehicles, spaceships, basically all of the Star Wars universe is in here. Now, this has been contributed lightly to because there's a lot more in the universe. I've noticed that if I go to the About section, um, you can actually see the statistics on the data that's been entered. Uh, it only shows 87 people, 61 planets, 37 species. But me being a Star Wars fan, I know there's a lot more. But it's a great example to show uh, what I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, this is good, too, because it keeps me honest when I show you the values that are coming back. So what we're going to do here is let's go back to the documentation. And there is the people endpoint. And this is the URL of the people endpoint. Basically, all the characters in the Star Wars universe we want to pull back. So let's go into the app, add data, click on rest, and all we have to do is paste this in. Uh, we also want to use the pagination type. In this case, we said it was next URL. And the next URL here, if I go back, you can see is root slash next. Okay, and then we'll just give it a name, and I'll call this one Star Wars Rest People. So in this example, I'm going to focus on a little bit more on the nested JSON schemas that come back. Okay, so you'll notice when I click on root, there's information. And remember how we said root next? So that's how I know the pagination type here in this particular example. This is also lightly documented because it's more of like an open source community type database. So documentation is not as easy to come by like the other more documented APIs. And then there are the results. In this case, this is the results for the people. But notice that we also have links to films, species, vehicles, starships, etc. Okay, so in this particular example here, what we're interested in is taking the results as well as the species. Now you'll notice species when we click this, it's just a link to another URL. In other words, there's another endpoint that returns back the species information. So we need that information and what we're gonna do is we're gonna associate the two different data values coming back from the two different endpoints. Okay, so we have to set up two separate REST connections. So coming back here from the results, you can see I want name. So I'm gonna check all of these and then I'm just going to uncheck these for now. So under results, this is going to be person name. And you might need to rename these header values because when you start to retrieve data in this manner, it uses the same names and you'll get conflicts with the values. So it uses the same um, name for the field. So keep that in mind. So we'll take height, mass, hair color, I don't want Homeworld. I don't care when it was created or edited. And these are those keys that we mentioned. 
In this case here, I'm not going to use any of these keys right now. What I want is this people key because we're going to use this people key a little bit later, which is going to join us up to the species key. So I'm going to actually change that value of URL to people key, like you see here. And I'm going to click load data and finish. Okay. Now we're going to go back click close and we're going to go into the data load editor and I'm going to unlock and we're going to create a new connection and you can see here's another way of creating connection in this case click rest connector let's go back to our API and this time I'm going to grab the species endpoint Paste that in. Pagination. That's root next. And we'll call this one star wars rest species. Okay, so right underneath this location here, now we're going to grab data for the species. And you can see in that root, we don't need anything, but you can see 37 records, results. And there's that name again. In this case, this is species name. So I'm actually going to put in species underscore name. I'll just call it spec name for now. And let's see. If we uncheck all and check, then we can get all of the values. And we can uncheck a few of these. Okay, now watch how I link these two tables together. Okay, do you remember how I had something called people key? Well, look what's in people. Okay, there's that people value, that people key, right? So what we're going to do here is we're going to rename this people key. And that's going to link the other table's people key to here. But I still have to link this results table to this people sub schema. I know it sounds weird, but when it comes back with, from JSON, these are represented as different tables. So here is where we have those key results. We don't need this, which is called key result. Uh, key. This is the root. This is what we want. This particular column here is what's going to link up here, key results. But since it's a generic name, what I'm going to do is instead of calling it key results, I'm just going to call it uh, spec key. And then when we go here, I'm going to call this spec key. Notice I'm giving it the same name. Okay. And then we don't want films. Okay. So now I'm going to insert that script, click load data. Notice we have 87 records for 87 people. And I'll even bring you to my um, data model viewer. And you can see how the tables are linked. Okay, so there's my people table. There's my species table. And there's that people key with all the other information. See how it links those? It's kind of like a link table. It links the people and the species together. So now we'll go back to the app overview. We'll go to the new sheet and I'll grab, actually, you know what? We can just do very simple select boxes. So let's grab people name or person name. There's all the people. Let's grab uh, KPI, add measure, and let's do people name count. There's our 87 people. And let's grab our species. In that case, I called it spec name, I believe. And there's all the species. And let's also grab another KPI. And then do spec name, count spec name, and we have 37 species, just like the data stats showed us earlier. 
and then to show you that they're properly linked, I don't know how many of you know about the Star Wars universe, but for example, um, Luke Skywalker was a human. So I'll type in Luke Skywalker. I click Luke Skywalker, and you can see he automatically comes up as human. Okay, if you're familiar with uh, droids, let's search for droids. And right off the bat, I know R2-D2, C-3PO, BB-8, and there you go, BB-8, C-3PO, R2-D2, and a couple other ones there. So it kind of shows you some of the correlation between the species and the person values, okay, and how they will link together, okay? So I thought you thought that might be a fun way to see how we could link two endpoints and how the relationships are brought together. Now, again, each RESTful service is going to be different, but hopefully you've seen enough in the three different examples on how you can retrieve the data from those endpoints and how you can get more data from the pagination settings, and then also how you can link those schemas together with the various uh, key strategies. Okay, so where and when can REST be used? REST can be used pretty much anywhere there is a service or source of data that supports the REST API. Many popular software applications provided by Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and even a variety of social media outlets, big data packages, and simple web services offer RESTful interfaces that enable connectivity between applications. Even the ClickSense platform offers REST-enabled services that allows communications and interoperability between a customer's application and our Kix Engine visualization and management APIs, allowing them to develop unique and custom analytical applications. Now note there are a few limitations to consider, both from the Click REST connector as well as the REST service you might be accessing. As I mentioned earlier, the Click REST connector is only available in ClickSense Cloud Business, Enterprise, and the free desktop versions. It is not available in the free ClickSense Cloud Basic or subscription-based ClickSense Cloud Plus. OAuth authentication is not directly supported, so the connector will require you to pre-authenticate against the service and get a user or application token. Depending on the service, sometimes these tokens will expire, requiring you to update the connector configuration with a new token. The click rest connector only allows get and post methods, as you have seen, so there isn't any operations for put, delete, etc. However, we have not seen this to be uh, used often and not really a limitation with analytics. In regards to the REST service API you may be accessing, there may be a limit on the number of requests you can call or rate limits, therefore limiting the amount of data you can pull from the service at one time. Certain IP addresses from the client system can even be blocked for a period of time if the service determines that abuse is taking place. So please be considerate of the rules of the REST API service before hitting it with multiple requests. I even learned that the hard way when preparing for this webinar before I found the Star Wars API. I was using a site named Giant Bomb, which stores video game reviews. And during my testing, I hit the service so many times they actually banned my IP address. Okay, so to wrap up the presentation before we get into Q&A, I wanted to make an honorable mention of an add-on package that is available for ClickView and ClickSense, our Click Web Connectors. Now, to differentiate what I've shown you with the Click REST connector, you have seen a few ways to connect to various services using more of a generic approach. You needed to know the endpoint URL, the authentication method used, parameters needed, the pagination mechanism, and even the key sequence strategy to link the schemas together. Now, with the Click Web Connectors, much of this is already configured for you and presented in an easy-to-use console. We have over 20 connectors that are specific to a variety of cloud-based sources and services. Here's a list of the connectors currently available. Now, the architecture is quite simple. It is installed as a standalone service that runs on the same machine as the ClickSense Enterprise server. There is a web console that allows you to select the connector, provide the authentication, select the desired data operations, 
and configure additional parameters and even preview the data coming back. It is much more intuitive when compared to configuring the REST connector. At this time, a load script is generated with all the information needed and you simply copy and paste it into the data load editor of your ClickSense or ClickView applications. Okay, so that is all I have for the demonstration and presentation. We are at the 40 or so minute mark and at this time I'd like to answer some of your questions. If I am unable to get to your question, you can always reach out to me on Twitter or join the conversation on the Click community.